from Joe's mom's basement. It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what's the first thought you have when you hear the term economics? I bet I know your answer. Two words, boring. Well, we're about to change your mind on that front because joining us today is a guy who's created some of the world's most fascinating TED Talks, and they're all about economics. He's the professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University and a founding member of the Center for Advanced Hindsight, Dan Ariely. Plus, interest rates on high-yield savings accounts are dropping, and savers aren't happy about it. What can you do to combat this? We'll share our advice during our headline segment. And finally, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Anonymous. Man, that dude's parents must have hated him to give him a name like that. Anyway, we're going to reach out to Anonymous to answer his question about saving for a wedding versus saving for retirement. And of course, you wouldn't be here without some of my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are hiding somewhere. Hey, what the hell is this? Are we like playing one of Joe's board games, Carmen San Diego? What the hell? It's Joe and O J J G. Oh, those were some good times, Carmen San Diego with the kids. And say that, that's thinking back in the old school cartoons, right? That is going back. We might have some people that don't even know what, what uh, Carmen San Diego is. Hey, everybody, welcome to Old Video Games for the Win. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, you're Video looking games. at old cartoons, maybe? Well, there was the cartoons too, but my, my kids and I always played the Carmen San Diego games. Oh, I didn't even know there was a game. How about that? We never watched the cartoon. So there. Maybe there wasn't a cartoon. Maybe it was only a game. Maybe I remember it as a cartoon. <laughs> Maybe I think there was a cartoon. I know my truth. <laughs> I know my truth. <laughs> that voice you hear is the dulcet tones of the Mr. OG. Dulcet. I should look that up to see what that means. You're wearing your fight night t-shirt. I like yeah. that. The bull versus the bear. Another one of Which Brad's one is you? great designs. Oh, I'm I'm clearly the bear. In this relationship, you've always been the bear. There's no way in hell I'm the bear. You're probably right. Check out me. Huh. Boston. Runner. Cream pie donuts. Boston Runner. Got this shirt from our Somebody friend. chasing you? Mark Rosenblum, who ran the Boston Marathon. He ran the Boston Marathon. I got the shirt. I like that division of labor. I got to tell you, him running 26 miles and me getting this shirt. Oh. I was going to say, I was unaware of you doing Boston Marathon. Now, you have done marathons before, so I can't give you a ton of crap. I have, but, but, uh, but, but not Boston. But... If I had better workout behavior, maybe things would be better here. Oh, which reminds me, funny coincidence, we got Dan Ariely here today. How about that? Dan Ariely, big time behavioral economist. This guy's worked on so many different uh, interesting projects. He also has a unique story for people that don't know his story. Maybe he'll tell it to us today. But if you're somebody that thinks that you can maybe maybe negotiate these trying times better. Dan Ariely coming down to the basement, but first we got some headlines, so let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Investment News. This is written by Nicole Kasperson. Nicole writes, robo-advisor account surge during the pandemic, according to a report. Digital advice platforms are experiencing an increase in account openings amid the market volatility sparked by COVID-19, according to Backend Benchmarking's second quarter robo-report released last Monday. While the pandemic caused widespread disruption in markets, digital advice providers were well-positioned to transfer to remote work as they are natively built for digital communication. That resulted in an increase in account openings during the first half of the year, according to Backend Benchmarking's head of research, David Goldstone. Independent robo-advisors Wealthfront and Betterment both reported double-digit increases in account openings since the market sell-off began. Account signups are up 68% for Wealthfront, while Betterment reported a first-quarter increase in account openings at 25% compared with the prior year period. But listen to this. Meanwhile, TD Ameritrade saw new account openings for its automated investing platform jump 150% 
from the same period a year ago, the study note. Of course, I think TD Ameritrade's was just getting started a year ago, so uh, they were a little bit behind. But these are some pretty eye-popping numbers. We've talked a lot, OG, about people doing the wrong thing, right, by jumping on Robinhood and thinking they're crazy day trader. But it appears there's also a bunch of people doing the right thing by finally getting their butts invested. Depending on how the money was allocated, of course, in the accounts, and let's just assume that it was done based on their risk tolerance, both Wealthfront and Betterment as part of their account opening, ask you some questions about how you feel about volatility and that sort of thing. Assuming that it was invested according to an individual's risk tolerance, gosh, this is a really good thing. Yeah, this it's is a, a great thing for, it, for the average investor. I was very surprised to see this. Goldstone. I still think it represents a really small number of overall people, however. It so does, you know. sadly. Yeah. Robo advisors are bucking the idea that younger investors sell out of markets during tumultuous periods, Goldstone said. Instead, they're getting into the market and seeing it as a buying opportunity. It's funny to see, though, OG, the difference between the two psychologies, because you and I have talked before about some of these studies around what Robinhood investors have done, where they just insist on doing the wrong thing over and over and over. Yeah. But by the same token, you've got this other whole group of people doing what appears to be the right thing. Well, maybe if people are using Robinhood as the fun money account and their other investment accounts as their like, you know, you can only investment. You can only hope. That's I'm I'm, I'm assuming that everyone is doing the right thing. How's that sound? <laughs> Turning over a new leaf. That would be a first for you. Like who are you? What day is this? Does this mean the reality does reality th- versus versus <laughs> thinking about reality? Does it's, this does this mean the apocalypse is coming? The fact that you're saying this, that you're positive? Yeah. Uh, well, come on now. I'm positive. Positive. I'm right about stuff. Hey, oh, bam. Uh, no, I think that, you know, as it relates to the idea of Wealthfront or TD Ameritrade, just the concept of setting it and forgetting it. Schwab has their platform. Vanguard has theirs set up a system, do it the same time every time, put in the same amount of money. When you get a pay raise, put some of that extra money in there. You just have to do it all the time. Now, if you started this in the middle of March, you look like a genius when it comes to your investing strategy. You know, you're like, look at me. I'm up like 30% since March. Okay, maybe. You shouldn't count on that, right? Seven to 9%, maybe 10. Just, it's about the consistency of doing it over and over and over again that allows you the opportunity to, to grow. I mean, compounding works in such a weird way that if you start doing the calculations, I I was doing some math on the fly for a conversation that I was having about the power of compounding. And, you know, if you got 20 years, this bucket of money is going to turn into a million bucks. Like that's how great this is. But if you had another five years, it turns into almost 2 million. If you had another five years, it turns into like, two and a half million, like that compounding grows exponentially as time goes on. And so you don't see any of those benefits in years one through 10. It's like paying your mortgage off. You get that statement at the end of the year that says you paid $700 in principal and (laughs) $7,000 of interest. You're like, oh God, never going to make it. But the 29th year of your mortgage payment says you paid $7,000 of principal, $700 of interest. It's the same thing. Only this one's working in your favor, not against you. So don't get lulled into looking at it from the perspective of the returns, but use it as a system, set it up, do the same thing all the time. And in 20 years from now, you'll be excited about it. Our second headline comes to us from money.com. This one's written by Alina Dizik. I feel a little bit duped in quotes. Online banks keep cutting rates and obsessive savers aren't happy. Last year, Cass Waddell opened a savings account at online bank Marcus With the interest rate hovering around 2%, he hoped to earn what would amount to hundreds of dollars a year and essentially free money. Now, a year later, the account's interest rate has dropped by half. Much of those hoped-for gains seem unlikely to materialize. He's disappointed and not shy about letting the bank know it. Sad to see that Marcus dropped their APY. He recently tweeted at the bank run by Goldman Sachs, I hate the hassle of switching banks, but it might be worth it. Marcus didn't respond to a request for comment. Marcus didn't uh, reply to that tweet like, who are you? (laughs) We're sorry to see you go later, dude. Yeah. Pack your stuff. That'll show him. You show him, Ryan, or whatever your name is. Tweet at Marcus. Man, I'm pulling my money. Okay. Here's what frustrates me. I've seen this all over the place, right? Savings accounts 
lowering their interest rates. And yet, when you look at what the Fed did and you look at rates overall, OG, rates now are still hovering there near all time lows. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the trade off. And uh, I was reading an article the other day about this, and I don't, I don't know who to credit it to. So I apologize. But it was this topic, like everybody gets up in arms about their $20,000 savings account earning 0.8 instead of 0.9 or, you know, 0.8 instead of 1.2 or a year ago it was two point. I remember, I know you remember legit money market funds were paying eight in the late nineties and early two thousands. But at the same time, I also have a vivid memory of saving my mom just boatloads of cash by refinancing her mortgage from 8.75 all the way down to seven and a quarter. Right. I mean, I was the hero son. I was the best one ever. Like, look at all this money I saved you, mom. And imagine my dismay when, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago, I said something to her about it. I said, when was the last time you refinanced your house? And she said, I don't know, 2006 or something. Oh, gosh. She was at six and a quarter. What a great rate, she said. This is awesome, six and a quarter. The thing that will actually save you a ton of money is the fact that interest rates are really low. That's actually better for you than interest rates being high on your savings account. Because you look at it from the perspective of if you have $30,000 in your savings account, you have a robust cash reserve and you're getting 2%. But there's the converse of that too, which is that while Goldman Sachs wants to make a profit OG, when interest rates go down, your interest on your money market's going to go down. They're going to pay a rate that is competitive in and equals what everybody else is paying. All the rates are down. This person's tweeting at Marcus and it's a, I'm with you. It's a waste of time. Take your money and go. But it's also a waste of time because this is somebody who says they feel duped. Yeah. You know why you're duped? Cause you're not keeping up with what interest rates have done. You've no yeah. idea what the competitive landscape is. You think the man's socking it to you when what you really need to do is maybe get a little more educated on exactly why rates are down. Because when you look at all these other ones, you know, Marcus, Ally, Axos, all of these hot online accounts lately, they've all come down. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's a reflection of the interest rate environment. My point on this is, is that you're fighting the wrong thing. Yeah, moving against the fact that you you're losing 300 bucks a year of free money. Uh, it's called interest. So you're losing 300 bucks a year, but you're picking up the fact that you just save $58,000 on the fact that you refinanced your house to a, to a shorter term and a much lower interest rate than it was. Like I'll take low mortgage rates every day of the week until I'm like 60 and my house is paid off. And then I'll piss and moan about the fact that that rates are too low for my cash balance. But the reality is, is that this is actually helping far more people than it's hurting. Think about your variable rate. You know, if you have credit card debt, if you have auto loan debt, if you have mortgage debt, this is actually a really good thing for you. It's not a great thing for you if you've got a hundred grand in the bank and you were hoping to live on that the rest of your life. A spokesperson for Axo said its rates, quote, remain extremely competitive despite the falling interest rate environment. Ally said, through it all, we've remained committed to delivering consistently competitive rates. You haven't been duped, people. And 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 I'm totally with you. Look at the big rocks, right? I mean, this is such a small thing. I see people that are the energy that you're going to spend oh. on. I mean, the one thing that he said in the piece there was, you know, it takes so much energy to move banks. It does. So don't do it. You know, if you're in a place that's going to respond competitively now, guess what? If interest rates go up, which eventually they probably will. Banks are not going to respond as quickly <laughs> when they go down. They're like, Oh, sorry. Rates went down, you know, but when they go up, they're like, we'll just drag this out another couple of weeks another couple of weeks. And then people start complaining about it. They're like, oh, look, hey, we went from 0.8 to one. Go team. It feels like gas you know, prices, but, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gas prices go up. No problem. Oh, look at, there was a storing gas in, in 50 gallon tanks next to the, <laughs> next to the gas station. Cause they're not selling any. And yet the price is still two bucks a gallon. You're going, hmm, maybe you should lower the price a little, but anyways, don't, don't rage against the machine. I think that's Valuable a good first takeaway for today. Don't rage against the machine. That was my, uh, don't rage against was, the wrong machine. That was my nickname in college. <laughs> and, and, my, and I think our second takeaway is, well, you know, whether it's a robo or not, just getting invested and setting it and forgetting it and doing the right thing, which Dan Ariely, I'm sure is going to talk about. I mean, he's a behavior guy, right? Doing the right thing and just 
focusing on those actions that matter, probably going to be, probably going to be the win. Well, coming up next, for those of you who don't know him, you're in for a treat. Of course, if you do know him, you're also in for a treat, but you already know it. He is the James B. Duke Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Economics at Duke University. He's also the founder of the research institution, the Center for Advanced Hindsight. And today he's here on behalf of fintech company Capital. That's spelled Q-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. Of course, Capital is an incredibly popular money app. By the way, Natasha over at Capital, as we were scheduling this, just sent me something uh, earlier today. And I like this when stackers get uh, bonuses. But if you if you want to check out Capital, uh, Dan and I might talk a little bit about Capital, but mostly we're going to talk about just how to save money during this weird time of COVID and how to trick yourself into saving. And if anybody knows behavior and how to make it so that you overcome obstacles, it is Dan Ariely, but uh, Natasha says that the code stack has been set up, gives you $25 if you decide to sign up for Capital, Q-A-P-I-T-A-L, use uh, stack to get there. So thanks to Capital for doing that, but mostly thanks to Capital for making available Dan Ariely. When they said, hey, you want to talk to Dan? I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course we want to talk to Dan Ariely. One of the top people in behavioral finance. If you have not seen his TED videos after you listened to us, go watch Dan Ariely's TED videos. He has had how many millions? I think 15 million people have viewed Dan Ariely's TED talks. But enough about that. Let's just talk to him. I'm a dead shortwave. It's Dan Ariely. And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's our new friend, Dan Ariely. How are you, man? I am mixed. I am mixed. Um, it's Corona times, uh, very, very tough in many, many ways. And uh, because I deal with uh, human decision making uh, when it fails and when it's successful, uh, I'm exposed to a lot of terrible things. Uh, at the same time, that's on the bad side. On the good side, uh, I feel incredibly useful <laughs> when times are tough. It's the time when it's uh, clear that we need to understand human nature in a much, much deeper way. So I'm in high demand. Uh, I feel uh, very useful, but uh, I'm exposed to lots of pain. So that's that's the summary. Yeah, reading your column in the Wall Street Journal, I feel like the questions lately have been deeper and more problematic than they are usually. Not that they're usually not bad, but now it seems like the decision-making process has to be more crisp than usual. Yeah, um, and, you know, of course, I, I respond to just a few of the questions I, I get, uh, but there are lots of things about uh, people losing their jobs. Um, also, because I write for the Wall Street Journal and it's kind of a conservative newspaper, I, I get lots of questions about uh, challenges in relationships. I know you're, you're in the Airbnb somewhere. I hope you're escaping uh, a little bit, but the people who are uh, not escaping and the people who have multiple little kids and, uh, you know, are experiencing lots of traumatic uh, things. And then uh, fear, uh, older people are feeling very lonely. You know, the, the psychological, we see in the newspaper, the, the results of the people who are diagnosed and sick and the people who passed away. Uh, but there are other things as well, like uh, psychological stress, uh, trauma, uh, domestic violence that are not, that are not reported, right? It's, it's the, um, we look at the people who are uh, sick from COVID, but, but the consequences of the, the rest of it are incredibly severe and we're not, we don't really understand them or able to quantify them yet. Yeah. I want to dive into our decision-making here during this rough time for people. But first, it is the first time I'm getting to talk to you. I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. I know a lot of our listeners are a fan of your work. And I, I wanted to ask you some questions about you, your career, which might seem a little too light for now and for this discussion. But maybe on the other hand, we need to lighten it up a little. But I'm just wondering, how how does a guy get into 
behavioral economics and behavioral psychology. I can't see a young Dan going up to his parents saying, you know, when I grow up, I'd like to be a fighter fire or a behavioral psychologist. <laughs> how, did, yeah. how did that begin? So it wasn't on my agenda. The reason for my, my half beard is that I was badly injured uh, when I was younger and I spent lots of time in hospital and all of my interest came out of my own experience. So I had questions about pain medications and placebos and I had questions about how to remove bandages from burn patients and I had questions about procrastination and uh, how to continue getting difficult medical treatment day after day so a lot of it was really about like this terrible situation I got into and trying to think about uh, what, what is going on, you know, why hospital functioning the way, the way they were. And, you know, one of the, the, the terrible things is I was like plucked out of life at a, at a young age and I basically spent three years in the hospital in a, in a bed and it, it was terrible. But the good side of it is that I got to observe uh, almost as a third party, uh, my friends, I, I got to observe my, my uh, young adulthood passing me by, uh, reflecting in, in the eyes of my, of my friends. And I, being an outsider, uh, got me to have a little bit of a perspective in asking questions. And even later, when I uh, was out of hospital, I feel still a little bit like an outsider, uh, you know, I have lots of scars. My hands are strange. Uh, like when I shake people's hand, they don't know what to do. So there's lots of downsides to being injured, but uh, or at least in this, this visible way. Uh, for example, not feeling perfectly integrated in society. But the positive side as a social scientist, I think you get a little bit extra objectivity <laughs> because you can observe things. Uh, it's not worth it, right? I'm not recommending <laughs> it to anybody. <laughs> But I think that was it. And maybe one other thing is, you know, because of my injury, I think I also didn't feel like I need to follow the standard path of a university professor. Uh, so, you know, I got my PhD and I got my first job and I was publishing in academic journals. But I think that something about being injured was a little bit uh, freeing. Mm. I couldn't do anyway lots of things that people were doing. I couldn't use my hands very well. I have a hard time. Uh, writing things taking me a long time. So I think it also gave me permission to do things in a way that fits me. So anyway, so that was my, uh, my journey. I will say that a few things happened since I was a kid <laughs> until today. Uh, one of them is that we had a digital revolution. And the digital revolution was very good for social science. Right? If 30 years ago uh, you had a theory about how people get together in a romantic relationship... Uh, and you just wondered about it, now you have Tinder and eHarmony. And if you had ideas about how people shop, now you have Amazon. And the availability of data uh, made it much more clear that, that we behave irrationally. I think it's much easier now to basically say, I'm interested in how people behave and there's data science and we can, we can start exploring the data. Uh, behavioral economics started before there was data. You had to generate your own. You had to, you know, do experiments and so on. Now there's lots of really interesting data that is showing in a very clear way that uh, we have a long way between us and rationality. I was wondering there, too, a couple things. Number one was you talk about your school experience. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you were a physics and a mathematics major, but you transferred to philosophy and psychology. Was a lot of that because of this whole question of why, why people act the way that they act? I wish it was uh, this wonderful. No, I, I picked math and physics because I couldn't use my hands. And I said, what topic in school, in high school, I could study without using my hands? Mm. And I said, math and physics. I, uh, this is not nice to say, but I used to read homework in high school from an empty notebook. <laughs> I wasn't that good in doing homework. Uh, but, you know, high school math and physics is just not that tough. But then I got to university and I couldn't do it in my head anymore. So in the first year, I had somebody who would write on the chalk on the board for me and I would read to them the equations and say, cross this and do this. But I just couldn't do it. It's too tough. You know, there's something about doing math by hand that when you try to 
tell somebody else what to do, it takes forever and you don't get the same intimacy somehow of, of doing math. And I, I, I really couldn't, I couldn't do it this way. So I moved to, to philosophy. I just said, I need something that I don't have to use my hands. So I moved to philosophy and then uh, my mother went to register me. And when she went to register me, they said, uh, you can't do only philosophy. You have to pick something else. So she said, what do people pick with philosophy? And the secretary there said, oh, lots of people pick psychology with it. <laughs> so I said, okay. Now, when she came back and she told me, I was a little bit upset because the only thing I knew about psychology was the clinical psychologist in the burn department. I didn't really understand what psychology was about. I didn't understand that it was a whole branch of science and, and behavioral change. Um, so I was a little bit upset. Uh, but, you know, I was registered. I had nothing, nothing else but to start. But then when I started, um, I had a, an amazing fortune of having fantastic professors. And I fell in love. I fell in love with this area. And, and I think I fell in love for two reasons. One is, you know, social science allows you to study the things that you care about. If you're burned and you have issues with pain, you could study pain. Uh, if you have issue with procrastination, <laughs> study procrastination. Uh, I have uh, one of my uh, students, his parents declared bankruptcy when he was very young and he had a whole youth that was really with tough, struggling with money. And guess what? He is studying how to help people get out of poverty. Like there's something wonderful uh, about that. That's the first thing. And then the, the second thing is that social science really allows you to approach riddles and figure them out and figure them out in a way that helps people uh, do better. So, you know, of course you can do social science and figure out how to get people to gamble more, but you can also do and saying, how do you get people to wear masks uh, more frequently or keep social distancing or uh, save more for retirement or take on less debt. So, so it's a wonderful combination of, uh, curiosity, personal interest, and uh, being helpful. Well, it is funny to me as you're talking and as I think back on your books and your TED Talks and the times that I've heard you speak elsewhere, there's this underlying, maybe underlying is the wrong word, Dan, but this underlying theme of friction, right? I mean, there's there's been so much friction in your own life and there's so much friction between people saving and people uh, doing the right thing. I'm wondering, in your last book, Dollars and Cents, you partner with a comedian. Was that just a method to reduce friction, like bringing comedy to it uh, when you paired with Jeff Chrysler? So yes, yes and no, but, but in a different way. Jeff wrote a very funny book called How to Get Rich While Cheating. Right. <laughs> and, and I loved his book. His, his book was basically all about, you know, you want to get rich? Why work? Cheat. Like, look at Enron. Look at all kinds of things that happen. You know, why, what, what can't you do right that you're not getting rich? You know, and he would say things like, you know, you steal three slices of pizza. Now you go to jail, but you do the right crimes. Everything is fine. So he wrote that book and, and I loved it. And he came to teach in my class. And we became friends. And I really, really liked him. And, you know, my, I basically have a rule that I, I try to find people that I love and I try to find something to do with them. Ah. I don't, I don't, I mean, a project, right? So, so with Jeff, and I think it's a kind of friction that says, I, I want to work with people that I want to spend more time with them. Yeah. And for me, this is, this is the joy of the, the freedom that academia has. I can pick which projects I want to work on, uh, with whom I, I want to, to work with. And if you get to, to work on fun projects with people you love, uh, it's, it's endless joy. If I imagine friction, I imagine working with somebody you're not looking forward to seeing as a huge friction. <laughs> so I picked Jeff because, you know, he was a delightful guy and we became friends. Then we, we would have picked something to work on. It was, first of all, Jeff. And then what we were going to work on. So the friction, the friction is people first. It's interesting that I think comedy to itself just reduces some of the friction and, and brings, you know, you talk about how there's plenty, as you know, more than anybody, Dan, there's plenty of financial information out there. It's not about 
that. It's about getting people to do something, especially now, though. You know, you and I were talking early on about how many important decisions need to be made right now. But you also know as well as anybody that every day just seems to be a random day that ends in Y for most of us. Not sure if it's a weekend or if it's a weekday. When it's so important to make good decisions now, especially with things changing around student loans, mortgages, unemployment, how do we get rid of that friction to make the timely decisions we need to make more often now? Because I don't think it's about not having the right information. No, it, it's not. It, and it, it comes from lots of things, right? It comes from making decisions under stress. Uh, and it, it's come from uh, being depleted and not having energy to, to deal with. And there's lots of ways to try and fix it. But one way that I find in general that is helpful is to start by giving first advice to somebody else in your situation. So imagine you have a good friend. Imagine that your good friend is in your situation. Uh, think to yourself, what would you tell them? And the reason this is good is you take what we call the outside perspective. So imagine that you, you have this imaginary friend that is you. And uh, you're basically saying, okay, imaginary friend, how much money is coming in every month? And are you sure that this will keep on coming? And what if less is going to come? And what are you spending? Let's go over your credit card. And then you could try and give this friend advice. And the thing is that when we make decisions for ourselves, uh, we use both cognition and emotions. When we give advice to other people, we don't have that much emotions. We're much more cold and calculated and we see things in a more objective way. So <laughs> one good strategy is to give advice to somebody in our shoes and then go ahead and take that advice. Teach first. Yes. And, you know, and it's, it's good for lots of things, right? It's, it's good for uh, being more patient and it's good for taking a differential risk and so on. So that's one. Another thing that, that we need to do is we need to have an action plan in case things get worse. So what is tempting is to say, okay, right now I'm managing. Let me just continue like this. I don't want to think about it. It's unpleasant and so on. But what if things get worse? You can say, let me not deal with it. Let me wait until things get worse and then I'll deal with it. The problem is that if things get worse, now you're under stress. And under stress is not the right time to make decisions anyway. So a good thing to do is to have an action plan and say, okay, here's what I'm doing now. If things don't get better in three months, here's some steps I'm going to take cutting my expenses, for example. If things don't get better three months later, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and basically make an action plan. And if I lose my job, these are the things I need to do. And the moment you have this uh, alternative action plan in your back pocket, things are easier. Things are simpler. And then maybe another piece of advice, uh, you know this uh, notion called depletion. Depletion is the idea that when we uh, have full energy, like first thing in the morning, we're able to be more rational. But as the day goes on and we get more and more tired, it's harder for us to think and easier for us to fall for temptation. The other point is to say, let's try and make the most important decisions first thing in the morning. It's not a fun way to start the day, uh, but it is the, the best time in the day to try it. Like we have uh, only so much life in the battery, uh, so to speak. That's right. You start the day with a bit more energy than you went to sleep with. There was a concept that you introduced me to recently that I think we're all fighting against right now. You called it habituation. Uh, you mentioned it with respect to the crisis, but I'm also guessing that habituation kind of applies to our money in general, right? Can you explain habituation and, and how we fight against that? Yeah. So first of all, just to be clear, a lot of these concepts are not good or bad. They're just there. Uh, and they have good sides and have bad sides. So um, habituation is basically we get used to it. And again, I'll give myself as an example. You know, I was really badly injured. I'm kind of used to it. Am I used to it 100%? No. But let's say when I got injured, you, you would ask me, then how bad would life be if you got burned in 70% of your body and you had this and this amount of pain for this amount of years and then keep on with this disability? I would say that would be terrible. 
But the reality is that life became really terrible and then it slowly got better and then I got used to it. And I'm not the same as a non-injured version of Dan, but I got used to lots of elements like this. And partly I got used to functioning without much use of my all, all kinds of things. So habituation has the good side. We get used to bad things. It has the bad side. We get used to good things as well. And then another thing is that we, we end up getting used to things and not rethinking about them. So, for example, in the world of spending, we just get into um, a repertoire of spending uh, without thinking about the quality of life that we get from that. And so money is not about spending money. It's about buying joy. You want to buy the most joy you can with the least amount of money you can, right? It's, it's that balance. We want money for retirement. We want joy now. How much money do we spend for how much joy? But if you look at your daily expenses, you will probably find places where you're spending too much and not getting much joy from it. Uh, for example, for me, uh, giving up television was, was wonderful. Not only am I not paying for television, I've discovered life is better <laughs> without the television. But, you know, there are other things like that. Uh, during uh, COVID-19, uh, we all probably are eating out less and cooking more. I am getting really good at omelets. <laughs> <laughs> but you can ask yourself, uh, COVID-19 uh, forced us to change lots of our habits. Which of those are we happy with? Imagine a year ago, I would come to you and say, Joe, would you mind for the next three months not to eat out? And then in three months, tell me how it was. And I say, how, how would it be if you didn't eat out for three months? You would say, oh, it would be terrible. I'm not willing to try it. I'm so sure it will be terrible. I'm not willing to try it. All of a sudden, we were forced to do all kinds of things differently. And now it's a really interesting time to evaluate and say from all the things we did differently, which ones are good and which ones are not. Our brain basically wants to do things that are repeated. It demands the least amount of energy, the least amount of thinking. So you say to yourself, I did this before. I only make good decisions. Therefore, that must be a good decision. Let me do it again. No need to think. No need to rethink. So we end up in all kinds of processes that we never thought would be there for a long time. Now we cut them. <laughs> Many of them morning coffee, you name it, right? There are probably many of those. Just, just for fun, go back after we finish our discussion today and look at your credit card from November. And, you know, which, which one of those habits were good ones and which ones were not? Right? At the moment, when you were in it, it was very hard to get out. But we got, we got out of some of those. Good time to evaluate. I think that's a great evaluation going back to last year and seeing how many of those expenses I missed that I don't have anymore that I've been forced to reevaluate because of this. I have uh, one more question for you. You're here today on behalf of uh, Capital. And I just absolutely love, Dan, the whole fintech movement and how companies like Capital are doing things that, frankly, in my opinion, a lot of the big banks maybe should have been doing for a long time, but they haven't. What are some of the things using your behavioral expertise that you guys at Capital have put in place to help people save more money with less friction or maybe add to their motivation to put some money away? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll mention two things. The first one is the debit card that Capital has. And uh, we study debit cards. And it's a debit card where you put an, an amount of money in and it basically goes down. First of all, we found out that it's best to put money in and have it go to zero than having a credit card that only goes up. Because going down to zero, you see what the end is. Yeah. If you charge something on a credit card, when do you stop? So going down is better than going up. The second thing is we found out that a month is too long. If you say, I want to spend on discretionary spending $2,000 a month and you put it on your card, you'll overspend. Why? Because in the beginning you'll say, oh my goodness, I have $2,000, it's a lot. But then, then it runs out. So we found that a week is better than a month. And then we found that starting the week on Monday is better than Friday. <laughs> Why? Because if you, put, if you put $500 on the weekend, you feel rich and you spend too much. If you put it on Monday, you try to wait for the weekend, right? You savor. So 
going down and not up, weekly and not monthly, Monday and not Friday. So, so Capital has this card that you declare how much money you want to put in every week. It loads every Monday, counts down, and you can see basically how much do you have for this whole category of discretionary spending. Uh, by the way, it's better to have a category for discretionary spending than categorize differently uh, restaurants and Ubers and, and so on. It's good to have them in a the category, partially because you can move things within them, but partially because if you try to count each of them separately, it just drives people bananas and they stop. Another thing we do, and there's lots of others, but another thing we do is when you get your paycheck, okay, so think about the following. Imagine two people, both get paid on the first of the month. One of them has the rent check coming out on the second, one has the rent check coming out on the 19th. What's the difference between the, these two people? The difference is that the second person for 18 days thinks that they're rich. You're not rich. Just the payment didn't come out yet. But if you look at your checking account balance, you would get the false impression for 18 days. Another feature is to basically take out those bills from the account so that you get to understand your real balance. Ah, uh, so take it out ahead of time, even though it's gone, not yet gone, it's, you know it's going to be gone. That's right. So that's important. Um, and there's lots of things like that. Uh, there are goals, right? It's, it's good to save for goals. So basically, capital is all based on understanding how people really think about money and trying to create a system that helps us think about money the right way and takes away wrong ways of thinking about money. Well, I love anything that helps us reduce friction and, and gain more motivation, Dan. Thank you for spending some time with us uh, today and helping us uh, through this tough period. I really appreciate you and I appreciate very much what you do. Thank you. My pleasure and looking forward to our next time. Hey, trivia fans. You know, now that Dan Ariely has taught you a little something, something about economics, it's time for me to get you up to speed on finding out where Joe's been hiding. I've been to Texarkana. Apparently that wasn't right. And then I remembered he'd gone to Georgia. How <laughs> about them peaches, huh? And while I figure out exactly where I am right now, let's get to today's trivia. On this date in history, the final Soviet Union president, Mikhail Gorbachev, was overthrown by a coup. The question is, what year was the USSR broken up? I'll be back faster than this road trip is over. This episode is brought to you by the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast by a good friend of ours that you should definitely check out since you're clearly a fan of high quality, fascinating podcast hosted by interesting people. By the way, that is totally a Jordan Harbinger read. There is no doubt in my mind that Jordan just wrote the stuff that I the stuff that I just read. There is no doubt in my mind because talking to Jordan, you know, I'm very interesting and this is going to be an exciting conversation. What's funny is, is that Jordan is a guy that I've known for a long time. He's helped this show a ton. Like I have learned so much about podcasting from Jordan Harbinger, but this guy leads with confidence. But you know what's cool, OG? He backs it up. I mean, whenever, whenever we listen to the Jordan Harbinger show, it's always, it's always just amazing stuff, whether it's Bob Saget that he's talking to about comedy or he's talking to um, what was the recent one with the woman in, in Italy? We were just talking about her the other day, Amanda Knox. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Jordan always asks some of the key questions that if you know anything about Jordan and the stuff that he's been through, you know, he was taken hostage at one point. If you've never heard Jordan talk about, negotiating with your captors to try to be released when you're a hostage, you're missing out. So Jordan not only backs up the bravado with good stuff, he covers a wide range of topics with just super heavy hitting guests, a ton of episodes rooted in the business and tech space. Don't just check out the ones that I talked about. Go just go listen to a couple. You'll get hooked very quickly on, on Jordan's show. There's an episode for everybody, though, no matter what you're into. The show covers stories like how a professional art forger somehow made millions of dollars while being chased by the feds. 
and the mafia at the same time. Jordan's also done an uh, episode all about birth control and how it can alter the partners we pick and how going on and off the pill can change elements of our personality. The podcast covers a lot, but one constant is his ability to pull useful pieces of advice from his guests. I promise you, you're going to find something useful that boosts your productivity or maybe just gives you that little mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. OG and I love the Jordan Harbinger Show. We think you will too. Search for the Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H A R B as in boy, I N as in Nancy, G E R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's the Jordan Harbinger Show. Check it out. Hey, trivia fans. So it turns out it must be close to the beach because everyone keeps saying, roll tide. I love the beach, and I'm sure when I find Joe, and more importantly, Joe's mom with those delicious chocolate brownies, we're going to all party Georgia style with some barbecue and maybe a foamy beverage or two. In fact, maybe I'll buy the first foamy beverage for you if you got this little factoid correct. Question was, what year did the USSR break up? Well, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic fell on this day back in 1991. Unlike those Ruskies, I'm sure there'll be no protests from Joe and OG when they learn I'm coming back to see the team. Gotta get back to the road. See ya! Big thanks to Dan Ariely for stopping by. You were close. You said 1989 for the year the USSR broke up. Yeah. Hunt for the review, I would have said 91. Just, just an exciting time. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency are all about making things easier so that you can spend your time doing those things that you love doing and less time on life insurance. Why would you go to one of the old school life insurance agencies where you're going to fill out a 50 million page form? When at Haven Life, their application simple, it's online, you get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, get to the stuff that's important, covering yourself is important, but it doesn't need to take forever. That's why we like Haven Life, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to, well, it looks like it's anonymous, OG, dun, dun, dun. You know what Paula and I do over on her show, the Afford Anything podcast? She decided that we're going to make up names for people. So she has people make up names and I'd like to pay that forward by saying that if this person's not going to give us a name, you should, you should create a name for them. Oh, uh, this is going to be, uh, is it a man or a woman or do we care? I don't think we care. Okay. It's, uh, it's Chris. It's, oh, there you go. It's Chris <laughs> from, uh, where's Chris from Reno, Chris from Reno, Nevada, Chris from Reno, Nevada. Say hello. Hey, Joe and OG. I am a recent college grad working my first full-time job, and I'm also getting married in January. I don't need to make any student loan payments until October, and that is also when I'm eligible for my employer's 401k plan. With having to save for my wedding at the rate I currently am, I am able to make about a $200 contribution every month to my Roth IRA, and I can't make any contributions to the 401k yet. I am saving about $1,000 a month just for the wedding. Do you think I should take some away from that and move it to the Roth IRA for now? Thanks. Hey, thanks, Chris. You know what's cool about those weddings in Reno, OG, is that you can just go to that wedding chapel, a very low-cost wedding. Might even wear like a— No one goes to Reno, so you don't have to worry about it. No (laughs) no one's going to come to your wedding. (laughs) What the hell are you talking about? Man, that just got real in a hurry. Hey, Chris, stop saving because nobody loves you and they're not coming to the wedding. No one's coming to Reno. You were. Uh, I've been to Reno one time in my life. You were so positive for like the first 15 awesome. minutes of the show and it's it's gone off the rails. It's gone. It was different. Reno's a different place. I, the Sierra Nevadas are nice. How's that? I like Reno. I almost went to school at the University of Nevada there. They recruited oh, me to run for them. Yes, I did. Oh, crap. Yeah. Nope. True story. Anyway, so did Chris. Well, uh, so here's the uh, here's my thinking on this. The way he put this was as if to say, should I put some in there for the time being, as in I'm going to take it back out again? And if the answer to that is, yeah, I take the money back out again. No way, dude. 
you have to keep your money separate. I hate the fact that when we look at these uh, different types of accounts, you know, all these different rules that you get, well, you can take $10,000 out of this for this reason, or during COVID, you can take $100,000 out of this for this reason. If you start thinking of your money as just a slush bucket of like, eh, if I want to buy a boat, I'll take it out of my Roth, or if I want to buy a house, or if I want to get married, or I don't pay for my kids' college, I'll take it out of my 401k, I'll just do a loan, then then it doesn't have the the importance in your mind of the specific goal. So despite the fact that this stuff is, is liquid and you can take your contributions out, I would never park money for a few months in a Roth IRA or any other type of long-term, specifically designed long-term account. It just tricks your brain into thinking that it's forever liquid and, and that's not the message you want to send. I would make sure that uh, starting in October, you take advantage of the workplace plan. Make sure you get that company match if there is one. I'm assuming that there'll be some sort of company match. Maybe they defer it for a while because of the COVID situation. A lot of companies are doing that. But you can uh, likely create a Roth 401k in your workplace plan uh, and still get the uh, and still get the matching. So maybe you're going to have to back off the Roth contributions in order to do the the workplace 401k. And here's the good news: you're getting married in January. Nobody's going to come to Reno in January, <laughs> except maybe your parents or her parents. But um, it's a crapshoot to get there. Have you ever driven to Reno in the wintertime? Did you just use the words crapshoot and Reno in the same sentence? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really literally true. <laughs> you, know, you might almost die on the way up the mountain. but um, It depends on which side you're uh, coming from. Come from the not, not in January. Come from the west, it's hell. Coming from the east, you're crossing the desert. But you still have to go up in the mountain. How many times have you been to Reno? One time. It was amazing. Can't you tell? Loved every minute of it. Back in what, 84? <laughs> it, was, it was a while ago. Yeah. 97, 98. 98. I was in Reno for a brief moment best on the way year. to and from the Sierra Nevadas. Best year yeah. ever. In, in, it was the best summer. Yeah. In Reno. Yeah. Uh, you know. Anyways, so I was going to say, <laughs> since, since we got off track. But here's the good news. When, you're, when your wedding's done, you're going to have 1000 bucks a month to save. So don't stress out about the next like five months of what do I do. Just get the 401k set up. And then in January, after the wedding's paid for, I'm sure your wedding will be nice. I'm sure it'll be well attended. And uh, many years of wedded bliss I wish upon you and your bride. You know, um, I think about this, OG, the same way that you think about it, which is Think more about a foundation. I think a lot of people get concerned that, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to make my Roth contribution this year because I'm saving for a wedding or whatever it might be. And I feel like super savers especially try to get really granular on that stuff. And really the best thing to do is put money in a spot, like you said, where you're never going to have to touch it again, except for the right reason. So in your foundation, that first cornerstone that you want to have in place is good cash flow. He's already got good cash flow, but make sure you've got that emergency fund in place and then that you're saving automatically into toward uh, goals. So sit down with your future bride and talk about what the goals are first before deciding what you're saving into because different types of things are better for different goals. Now, clearly you want to get that 401k match. So I totally agree with you there, but also remember that life is sometimes expensive and uh, having money in an emergency fund so that when the car breaks down or you decide to get married a month early, whatever it might be. Because there's a shotgun behind you? Is that what you're inferring? <laughs> Pull this forward a little bit. Yeah, I guess think about it from the alternative too. If you get all stressed out about, I've got this thousand bucks and I should save it in my retirement plan instead of saving for my wedding, even though you've got that thing hanging over your head, that's definitely how you want to think about your wedding upcoming. Like I got this thing hanging over my head, man. <laughs> I got this wedding I got to do. <sighs> don't think about your wedding in that regard. But if you don't have the cash, what are you going to do? You're going to finance it. And if you finance it now, what do you got? You got a credit card payment and you've got high interest and that return. What would we tell you if you said you had a whole bunch of credit card debt right now? Say, well, hey, you got to pay that off. That's the best return you can get. Credit cards are 16 or 18 or 20 or 25% interest. Can't get that in the market. So by avoiding having it, by putting money in the right spots to begin with, and then, like you said, as you work into your career and as you start saving for other things, you're not always going to be maxing out every single solitary 
30, 40, 50 year goal thing. Cause you might have a kid and go, Oh, I've got a college thing I need to save for now, or I want to buy a house and now I need to save for that. And that's going to be different time frames for different goals. So adapt and adjust. That's all. Good job, Chris. Reno's a nice town. I was kidding. Yeah. And I <laughs> don't send any hate mail. If you do, you can send it to Joe. You know, Chris, whose name is probably Jim, is just driving down the road in Georgia going, what are you talking about with Reno? I love it. I do it. like this idea of putting some, some a place on there because I think we're going to do this from now on. Yeah, Paul's pa- on to something. Well, Paul and I haven't done a place. We just turn it into the latest movie we've seen and give it the name of the star of that movie. So this is a little different. That, and then you just put it, that person in this place in the movie. This is, oh, you could do that so this too. Is Elizabeth from London. I don't know who you're referring to there, but I'm sure that she would be just a lovely, lovely person to talk to. Big thanks to Chris for calling in. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And you know what? If your computer has a built-in microphone, if your phone, if you're able to talk on it, you can use that microphone. It's super. If you're able to talk on your phone. If you can talk on if your if phone. If you're unable to talk on your phone, I suggest you get a new phone. <laughs> I'm just trying to explain, Aji, how easy it is to leave us a voicemail. Stackofedgements.com forward slash voicemail. I think people think it might be difficult. And uh, Chris, send us, an, send us an email, by the way, if uh, you want your greatest money show on earth t-shirt. Also be fun to find out uh, where you really live. All right, that's going to do it for today. Big thanks to Chris for calling in. Big thanks to Dan Ariel. You know, Doug's going to thank everybody. Also, if you're somebody that needs good financial planning help in your corner, OG and his team are taking clients. So if you want the second half of the year to be a step in the right direction, maybe you wasted too much time, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG to get on their calendar and see how their team might be able to help make your team better. Last big thanks to everybody who has left us a review of this year's show that helps people know what they're getting into when they listen to the Stacking Benjamin show. Coming up on Friday, man, do we have fun. If you're new to the show, we always have roundtable discussions about popular blog posts in the financial community. Friday is going to be no exception, so join us for that. All right, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe, I got this one. First, take a lesson from our headline. While your emergency fund won't be pulling as much cash, the purpose of your cash emergency fund isn't to earn a high return. It's to be there when you need it. Second, take a lesson from Dan Ariely. By looking critically at the why behind money decisions, you can avoid wasting money on things you don't truly value. But the big takeaway... And it's a safety tip. Don't try to surprise people in Georgia by just showing up on their doorstep. Also, turns out the Freedom of Unity State is actually not Tejas or Georgia or North Carolina, where I just found out that Joe also went, apparently, he didn't tell me, where the hell is that guy gone? Special thanks to Dan Ariely for joining us today. We'll have a link to Dan's blog on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. We'll also have a link to Capital, that's Capital with a Q, and the special code for SB listeners to receive $25 if you decide to check them out. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
So we're in the after show. Don't talk about the after show. If you have to talk about it, we call it dessert. It's like Fight Club. Don't talk about Fight Club. We just ended yesterday and now completely today, the world's longest spring break. My kids have been on spring break since March the 6th. And um, <laughs> they are presently all in school. My wife is in a golf, golf, women's golf league on Wednesday morning. And it's quiet here. Is that I just think, heaven or what? It's different, but kind of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I love my kids and my bride, but man, that's a lot of in-person time over the last six months. I mean, it's been six months, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, about six months. Anyways, wish us luck. Sent the kids to school today, you know, in uh, hazmat suits and I'm assuming they'll come back in, in them. But, you know, with all the negativity in the universe, I posted a tweet that said, with all this bad stuff going on, what are some positives? And that's been the number one thing people have said it has been family time about the fact that, you know, what? I think I, people think they have to say that <laughs> I better say family time. Better say family. Oh yeah. Otherwise. Why? Oh yeah. Why are you hanging out on Twitter? If you love your family, <laughs> I'm sitting at a I'm table so trying to I talk to Halo nobody. one, two, three, and four on my Xbox. I played all the gears of war games to completion on veteran. That's what I'm most excited about. <laughs> like that's what people want to really write. But yeah, Cheryl and I yeah. went to this, I told you we were headed to this farm to table restaurant last night. And, uh, can you say last night? I, I feel like it was more Stop it. afternoon. <laughs> Time was your dinner reservation. They're don't, senior don't, citizens. Don't, Do they, have, don't, they give you a discount don't for do showing that. up at 415? No, it was 530. 530. Yeah, but what time did you really get there? You got there just in case a little early, right? I actually, no. I got there. I couldn't figure out how the iron in this Airbnb works. And so it took me forever. We got there at 531. But we were some of the, we were, I think the third table seated and the people there around us were significantly older than us, but I had to work on, on the book later, but it was funny halfway through dinner. So stop, stop with the old guy jokes. Cause there's yes, something sir. truly funny here. I grabbed Cheryl's hands. We're sitting there looking into each other's eyes. We got this beautiful view out the window of the green mountains. I grab her hands and I look at her and I said, I miss my Xbox so much. Where is it? <laughs> it was, you, didn't tra you didn't travel with it? It's in my mother-in-law's basement. Oh. Yeah. The silly place. for. I decided I was going to go without it uh, for, you know, this this whole journey. And what a flipping mistake that was. That was a big, big mistake. So you bought the new one on Amazon? <laughs> it comes tomorrow. No, no. I, I have not. Uh, I do have a game on my computer. I have Steam, the service Steam, where you can buy computer games. And, and I have a game where I'm uh, the manager of a uh, baseball team in the, the uh, Detroit organization. I am the manager of their Dominican Developmental League team. And you start at the bottom. And if they do well, you work your way up. And right now my team's tied for third place. I'm very proud. Halfway through the season, although I got shelled <laughs> last night by the by the Phillies, that's why we had to eat at five thirty so I could get home and play some baseball. Yeah, the game. Nothing. Fo dogs. Nothing follows up a romantic dinner like, "Hey, honey, I got to go play some baseball." Such a sweet talker. 